person. I had somebody try to insult me, or a couple people suggest that um, I was couch hopping and hopping from one place to another, making it sound like I was just, for one thing, su suggesting that possibly I was intimate with different people, which wasn't the case. And, and then more importantly, making me look very unstable and unsettled. And in some ways, the, the constant moving around by moving from one address to another, that, that did occur more than it should have, but that was not my fault. It wasn't because I was unstable. I was actually working the entire time. And I didn't have enough money to afford an apartment completely on my own in Washington, D.C. It's very expensive. So when, at, so when first I have no money and I have to find a place to stay, that's one challenge. And then trying to hold on to what very little I had in anticipation of possibly using it towards helping my son, that was another challenge. So... There was not ever a time that I could have realistically afforded a safe apartment in a safe area all on my own. And actually, most people over there don't even don't have their own apartments. They typically a lot of people there over there um, rent rooms. So it might be a large house, and everybody rents a room. It's just it's a different situation. So, one thing that I, I was trying to think about, the order of events, you know, where I was staying before I, before the miscarriage of my son, and actually I don't, I want to say it was, it was actually a murder, because it, it was a murder, and then I miscarried as a result of the murder of my son. And I'm, I'm speaking about my son that was unborn, who by law is given the same standing as a, as a live person. And so any assault against my unborn child is, is considered to be an actual assault against a person. And killing my unborn child is considered to have the same weight as killing a person that's alive. My living son, Oliver, was, has been tortured. He's had horrible things happen to him. And then my unborn son was tortured first while in my womb and then murdered. But before talking about where I was staying, to the Canadian Embassy. And I, I think that I went to the... I did go to a... Um, to an Iranian Embassy at some point to ask in tears. It was before I was pregnant. Asking if... You know, telling them about the political asylum situation, about my son. Was there any way anybody could help? Or that anyone thought they might be able to help? And, and then I, I went there one time and they said, we'll send a more complete report or whatever, and then we'll look at that and contact you. But I, I got so busy with trying to have work and making sure I had a place to live that I never ended up sending anything to them. I was trying to find a psychological evaluation that was ordered by court. I, I had so many different things to do. And I was still, I was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder because of the trauma of what they had, have to, having them take my son from me. So there were certain things that were very hard to bring myself to do um, because of my level of anxiety already. And then I was balancing work. And I was working in the public eye. And balancing my living situation and then all of this legal stuff. I was n 
never in a state of mind where I could have gone to the Georgetown or whatever or any other university and have asked to use their law library. That was not possible. The amount of trauma that was incurred because of the state taking my son from me made that impossible. I went to CPS, tried to follow through with the basic court order and that kind of thing, asked for my documentation. I, I tried very hard to get my records. But, you know, trying to go to a to a law library wasn't wasn't practical and it wasn't it was not possible. I it, it was hard enough for me to do with the things that I was doing already. And at some point, because I knew that this this uh, illegal coercion to have me force a false confession, I knew that that would, could have bearing on my record. You know, I mean, my record with Canada and how innocent Canadians viewed me, as well as how the United States viewed me and innocent people in the United States viewed me. Because I'm sure there were some innocent United States citizens that maybe had access to intelligence records. And what do they find? Oh, well, let's see. Looks like Cameo Garrett is having a problem in the Pacific Northwest. Doesn't sound too good. And then now she's having a problem in Canada, too. I mean, some someone who had never met me and didn't know me at all might think that I was the problem. And I knew on an international level, for other, anyone from any other country, possibly who had access to international kinds of records, that could affect my ability to travel, as I had wanted to do with my son. So, the, the main and, and most form of, the foremost thing in my mind was that the fact that it was a false confession that I had to sign. I, I needed to get that off of my record and have that um, corrected. I wasn't even necessarily in a state of mind where I was wanting to make a big complaint about somebody. I just wanted them to fix it. And I, I didn't need to have that there for CPS to dig into and latch on to and try to use against me, along with anything else, you know, that was false. So I went up to, I was in Washington, D.C., and I, and I one day, I didn't, I don't think that I looked up the, the embassy, but maybe I did, because it was an important thing for me to do. But I kind of think that I was just walking one day and I happened to see, oh, that's the Canadian embassy. And it was huge. They have one of the largest embassies in Washington, D.C. I mean, some of these uh, different embassies, they have their smaller houses and kind of next to each other. The Canadian embassy was, was an enormous fort. And I, I went in and told someone that, you know, what, why I was there and, and what I have done. I said, I, I was in Canada, and I had, I was told to leave when I was trying to get political asylum. And I said, and then the second thing that happened, like the main thing that I was then talking to them about, is that then I was forced to sign a, a, a um, false confession that made it sound like I was trying to go back to Canada after their judge had just told me not to. And I need to have that corrected. So that's what I said. And I was told, I was given a runaround, I was told to go to immigration matters, and I said, this isn't an immigration matter, this is a political asylum matter and a, an abuse of, of the RCMP, of the police matter. I said, I, you know, the, the fact that this border patrol person had me sign a false confession. I said, that didn't have anything to do with immigration. I wasn't trying to go to Canada. I was in the United States, and I wasn't trying to go over to Canada, and he made me sign a false confession, so that's not an immigration matter, that's a corruption matter. And they kept trying to tell me to go in this huge line with, for immigration, and it didn't, that specific event of being forced to sign the false confession had nothing to do with immigration. It was corruption. And Canadians knew that. I, I guess they they thought that I was dumb, or didn't 
didn't know how their system worked. And then I found out, finally, after a long time, someone agreed with me and said, yes, if what you're saying is true, that would not be an immigration matter. That would be, they said, border patrol or corruption. And so then, of course, then I said, okay, thank you. And I, I, tried, I tried to wait there. And first, as I was outside, I remembered that this limousine or a long sedan pulled up close to me. And this woman got out, and there was a man with her, and then they were being greeted by people, and she was sort of, she seemed halfway, uh, she, she seemed, my impression of her was that she was sort of cheerful and laid back and, and professional, and she had some sort of standing in, in some way because people were, were treating her in a certain way. And the man that she was with was the same. So um, she she wanted to approach me, or maybe I approached them and then she talked to me. I, I don't know. And I, and I asked, I said, I, I think that I had just been told to leave the Canadian embassy. And since they were going in and I thought they might have some kind of a position with that embassy, I asked, I told them very quickly what the situation was. I said, I, I was forced to sign a false confession at a border in Canada that said I was trying to get into Canada, but I wasn't. And the whole matter was that I was forced to sign a false confession, and I needed to speak with someone, and they said, yes, you wouldn't go to immigration, you would go over there to that embassy. But then someone drew her away from me, and she gave me her business card, and it was Ingrid Olson, uh, Ingrid, whatever it was, because I've written it down, and <clears throat> I don't have it on the top of my my mind right now. <clears throat> but her business card said that she was a diplomat, some kind of a diplomat. And I then was able to go with them and walk with them back into the Canadian embassy. And then I was inside and I was seated at, seated in the lobby. And I could tell that there, there were people who knew who I, there were people already there, right there in their embassy that knew who I was, because they, I remember one woman in particular, she kept looking around the corner and staring at me, she hated me, and I, and again, I thought, how am I so, how, how am I known at all? Unless there is some group that, you know, what, has my, my name and picture on a board, and they've passed it around so many times, like some kind of help wanted ad. You know, this woman is, you know, keep, keep on the lookout for Cameo Garage. That is pretty much the kind of treatment I, I was getting. And the, the one woman, there was some sort of receptionist. She was very cold and hostile. She didn't want to do anything for me at all. And she was one of the individuals who acted that way. And I, she then talked to somebody else who told her to wait and they might have someone to come down and, and meet me. So I sat in the lobby and I waited, and then a very young man came downstairs and talked to me. He was in his early 20s. Light brown hair, you know, like medium. I, I guess not light, but light to medium brown hair. 20-something. And he sat across from me and talked to me for a little bit. I thought that, I thought that he was just somebody who was waiting for someone, or that worked there in a non-professional way. Or, but he was probably the person they, they wanted to have me talk to, and he just didn't announce that. But I thought as I was chatting with him that I was waiting for someone else. <clears throat>